All right, nine o'clock on the dot. We'll go ahead and get started. And as anyone who has had an opportunity to teach knows, by the time you get done preparing, you always have about two to three times the material that you'd want to talk about. Uh, and you're, you're cramming uh, two to three hours worth of material into about 50 or 55 minutes. So we'll start on time. We'll start making it through. And I'm sure we'll have some uh, folks joining us. So I think everybody in here knows who I am. I'm Sam Greenwell. I have the, the privilege of uh, leading our Awana ministry uh, here at the church. And I know many of you uh, serve alongside me in that. Um, for this morning, we're going to be finishing our study of Second Peter. We're going to be covering all of chapter 3. And then here in the next couple of weeks, we'll go ahead and move into Philemon and Jude. Um, so sort of is the, the way to, to get us all awake and going. Um, I'm going to ask you, what are the things that you find you need to be reminded of? And as I was thinking through this, you are probably not the right person to ask that. The right person to ask is, what would your wife say that you need to be reminded of? What are the things your husband would say you need to be reminded of? Or your kids? Or You, you understand uh, what we're getting at. What would those people say you need to be reminded of? And I think that's a, a common characteristic of people, uh, that we need to be reminded of the things that we are to think and to say and to do. And when we look at 2 Peter chapter 3, it's really Peter's final opportunity to say, believers, these are the things that I want you to think about, to say, to do. These are, these are those final words that he would have the opportunity to share with these believers. And so really, 2 Peter 3 sums up Peter's final words, likely from a Roman prison, uh, according to tradition. Uh, but we see that also in uh, 1 Peter. He's writing from prison there. But certainly in anticipation of his death. Uh, and we see that in 2 Peter chapter 1. So this, his final opportunity to, to tell these Christians that how they are to think, how they are to act, the things that they are supposed to do and say within a, a world of competing narratives, uh, and especially in reaction to false teachers um, and with the added difficulty of persecution. So, so that's really the background there. We've covered this brief, uh, in, in the other lessons on, on First and Second Peter, but just as way of a reminder, First Peter was written probably around 64 or 65 AD, and then Second Peter just a few years after that, in about 67 or 68 uh, AD. First Peter, if you had to boil it down to a catchphrase, could be boiled down to the idea of living victoriously in the midst of persecution. So I'm going to go through just a few verses to get you back in that frame of mind from 1 Peter, and then we'll do the same for 2 Peter, just so you're understanding the full context, really, of Peter's discussion or teaching to this, this group of people. So in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5, and this is a long, around that central theme of living victoriously in persecution. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Moving forward a bit into 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3, he says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Moving a little further, chapter 3, he says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Again, that flavor there, living victoriously uh, in persecution. And then finally, chapter 4 of First Peter. As each has received a gift, you may know this uh, from a hymn uh, we sing, by the way, here in church. 
Uh, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So again, we see this earlier, this first uh, letter that Peter wrote, living victoriously in persecution, and then fast forwarding a few years, now in Second Peter, the theme is now exposing and guarding against false teaching. And something that continually came to my mind as I studied this section, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of sort of the last words. We, we all understand the importance of the last things that we get to say to someone. And, and Peter is no different here. If you do a little bit of a study, really, any of the prophets, any of the apostles, when they have an opportunity to give that last word, we should take note and say, what are the things that were most important uh, in their mind? So in the case of Peter, guarding uh, or exposing and guarding against false teaching. So I'm going to read just a couple uh, more passages to bring us up to this final section of 2 Peter chapter 3. Beginning in 2 Peter 1, verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain." And then following in verse 21, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And then finally, chapter 2, verse 1, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction." And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation, condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So now, we are at the place where we're ready to move into Second Peter chapter 3. And what I'm going to do, we'll, we'll talk just for a moment to, to frame this a little more. We'll read Second. Peter. Peter chapter 3 in its entirety, and then we'll, we'll really get into the lesson. So we're, we're going to be about 10 minutes into this, and we've not even gotten to our... See, so you see what I'm saying? That there's more material here than, than you can get to. So I want you as, you, as we start to open up 2 Peter chapter 3, to look how he begins uh, this section that we're going to read. He begins this passage, and you'll see interspersed through here, is his use of the term beloved. So this sets the tone, a pastoral tone, a, a tone of care and concern uh, for these believers in these final words that he has to share with them. And for, for any of you who have experienced parenting uh, or who will soon be parents, or you know, at some point will be parents, this is akin to a parent uh, you know, grabbing the, the face of that two-year-old, focusing on them and saying, hey, listen, I need you to, I need you to listen here. Hey, all those other distractions, put down the phone. Hey, turn off the TV. Hey, listen, focus. Uh, and this is for your good. And so the, the three topics that we're really going to cover in this section are knowing that scoffers will come. Be reminded that scoffers will come. Next, be reminded God's judgment is certain because he's promised it. And finally, uh, in this, we're going to group it all together, final imperatives. Be reminded of these final imperatives, which are be holy in your conduct. Anticipate the Lord's coming and remain steadfast in the faith. Before we read uh, this section, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll keep going. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you as we study this final section of Second Peter chapter 3. We're thankful for these reminders that Peter is giving to these believers. And Lord, that we know in these reminders, they're not simply the things that were on Peter's heart, but they are things that are your concern uh, for us today. And that concern is that 
that scoffers will come, that people will not uh, believe the word that you have given. But Lord, we know too that you've promised that you will judge, that you are coming again. And so we anticipate that day. And Lord, we thank you for this, these reminders to, to be steadfast, to remain holy in our conduct. And Lord, that that anticipation of the Lord's coming uh, is to be a great encouragement to us. So as we study this word, uh, let it not be a time for us to just uh, observe what Peter has said to these believers, but Lord, to take this, um, this word and see it as a word to us, for us, that we might too be encouraged. Amen. All right, if you want to turn in your Bibles then, 2 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to read it in its entirety, and then as we go through this, we'll, we'll be touching back uh, and reading uh, sections again. 2 Peter chapter 3. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. I love that, by the way. Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. Following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So, we mentioned just a few moments ago the, the themes that we're going to be covering today. And those, again, so under the, uh, the banner of reminders, the necessity of reminders, those are uh, from verses 3 through 7. Know that scoffers will come. Know that scoffers will come. We'll move then into verses 8 through 10, where we see that God's judgment is certain because he has promised that there will be that judgment. And then continuing through the end of the chapter, verses 11 through 18, really under the, the heading of final imperatives for Christians. And those imperatives will center around be holy in your conduct, anticipate the Lord's coming, and remain steadfast in the faith. So really under this heading of the necessity of reminders uh, in verses 1 through 2, I want to just revisit that for a moment where he says, now, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind 
by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So it, it's, it's something that we all understand, but maybe we don't think of it in this way, but Christians aren't th- you know, seeking out the latest ideas of newly discovered theological truth. We are people of the word. We are people of the book. It's, we embrace established truth. We're not always looking for the next fad in, in, in finding new truth, so-called. God's unchanging truth was progressively revealed, and it's been given in its fullness. We need to be reminded that we go back continually to God's established truth. Just like children, as you know, I, as I mentioned in that previous scenario, or, or husbands, I'm sure you know the wives don't need to be reminded, but we'll focus on the husbands and children. Uh, just like they need reminders, all of us need reminders of this um, this foundational issue that we go back to God's word uh, and be reminded to go back to that truth. And so we want to ask, so what, what are these words that were spoken of by the prophets and apostles? Well, simply put, you could say it's the fullness of the gospel. I know in our minds, when we hear the gospel, we think something very specific in terms of, uh, just, you know, Jesus, uh, the incarnation of Christ, his perfect life, his death, and then his resurrection. We think in those narrow terms, but really the gospel encompasses the fullness of the revelation of God, God's full dealing with, uh, with his creation, his full dealing with mankind and how he has brought about uh, their redemption. So, so really, simply put, the fullness of the gospel is in mind here. And that timeless message of God's dealings uh, and his relationship uh, to his creatures um, encompasses ideas of the fall, creation, sorry, creation and then the fall, covenant, blessing, warning, judgment, joy, repentance, atonement, satisfaction of God's wrath, Victory over death, final judgment, and, and many more ideas, but that fullness of the understanding uh, from Scripture there. Just, you know, as, a, as an added aside, uh, for, for those who want something more concise with maybe a, a more, we'll say, succinct understanding of the gospel, it, it's never a bad idea to have something like a, a gospel elevator speech. If someone, if someone right now said, what is the gospel? A couple, a couple favorites, and you know, I'll, I'll uh, give my plug for Awana. A couple of fun Awana verses that, that fit this mold of an elevator speech. Ephesians 1.7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Or maybe you prefer 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So again, what's in mind here? The fullness of the gospel. But then we move into that, really the the first point under that heading of needing reminders, and that's know that scoffers will come. So before we uh, discuss specifics of those scoffers, it's interesting to know uh, that in Second Peter chapter one verses nineteen through twenty one, Peter uses this phrase, "Knowing this first, uh, in regard to Scripture's origin in God and not in man." So, if you want to turn there just briefly, Second Peter one verses nineteen through twenty one, and we're going to see a little bit of parallel use uh, of a phrase there. Second Peter one nineteen through twenty one, and there Peter says. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And then turning over a page to 2 Peter 3, verse 3, Again, saying, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. 
So where you see in one, the idea is um, ensuring we understand the origin of Scripture, that it's from God and not from man. But you see the connection there uh, with this other tandem use of knowing this first, that it's that scoffers will come in the last days. It's an interesting correlation uh, there in that, that first importance of the word and the connection that that has with people who are scoffers, that they scoff against the word of God. Moving on, reading 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 7, we're going to explore this idea of scoffing uh, more in depth. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So it's helpful to examine what the scoffers do, what they say, and what they willfully forget. Uh, you see in that, that section, it says, for what they deliberately overlook. I really like the, the New King James rendition where it says, they willfully forget. So this theme, and you also see in here, a theme of sensuality that frequently appears in Second Peter chapter 2 as well. So this correlation that you see here in Second Peter 3, uh, where it's... Uh, Uh, where it says in verse 3, it says, following their own sinful desires, or again, the New King James, following their own lusts. And so woven throughout 2 Peter 2 and 3 is this idea of really the, the combining of that scoffing being informed in part by their own sinful desires, by their, by their lusts. We're going to flesh this out uh, just a little bit more as we go through. If you look in 2 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavor. It says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And then immediately following. So you have here their, their theological supposition, and many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Interesting, again, the connection of their belief system with sensuality. Moving forward into verse um, 10, Peter discusses those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion. In verse 12 through 14, but these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for the wrongdoing. And then here's where we go. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. Their blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. So you see again that connection, that their belief system, what their theology and how it's informed by their insatiable lust. And then finally, verses 18 and 19 of chapter 2. For speaking, for speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh. Those who are barely escaping from those who live in error, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. And it's interesting in our world today, particularly in our world today, and, we, and I think we maybe imagine to an extent that, that this particular moment is, is unique from any other um, epic of human history. But really, you see, it, th- these words of Second Peter 2 and 3 could have been written today. So, th- you know, the idea of there's nothing new under the sun, at least in terms of the sinful desires of man. Um, but in our day and age, particularly, I guess, sexual expression is seen as the great exemplar of human freedom and liberation from the old-fashioned oppressive uh, cultural mores. However, 
Scripture turns this around and says the opposite is true. That those who are that have these kind of desires, they themselves are slaves of corruption. Um, I came across an interesting um, passage in a book. I don't know if any of you have read this. Alan Bloom wrote The Closing of the American Mind. It was written actually 35 years ago. Uh, last, uh, <laughs> last night. Last night, 35 years ago. No, uh, 35 years ago. But even at that time, he had this, and he's not writing from a, 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 a you know, perspective of a theologian, but a university professor remarking about some of the attitudes of those that he was teaching. So listen to this. Speaking of that generation of students, he says, as it now stands, students have powerful images of what a perfect body is and pursue it incessantly. But deprived of literary guidance, they no longer have any image of a perfect soul, and hence do not long to have one. They do not even imagine that there is such a thing. I, I found that just remarkable. Uh, and he's making this comparison to, you know, people get into the weight room, they want the perfect body. But, but there is a connection here to this idea of you know, sensual lust, of wanting, you know, our body is the, the fulfillment, uh, really, the, the the perfect body or the perfect sexual expression is the fulfillment, the greatest fulfillment that they can experience. And he compares that then, for he says that they, have, they no longer have any image of a perfect soul and hence do not long to have one. They do not even imagine that there is such a thing. What a, what a depressing uh, view of life. But I think that it, it captures to an extent what these people that, that Peter is talking about were facing. Just like in that culture, ours as well, you have potentially a generation of people that aren't even sure if, if such a thing as a soul exists. It should elicit uh, incredible compassion uh, from us as believers. So, so I'm going to open this up just for a second. In, in light of this, in really fleshing out this understanding of we have the mindset usually of saying, oh my goodness, look at these you know, licentious people and I can't believe it. Look at them parading around and all they want is you know, more fulfillment. But if you have a people that doesn't even recognize that they, that they have a soul, that they think the here and now is all there is, what, how, does that, how does that affect how we conduct gospel ministry? What kind of word do we have to offer to a world that isn't even sure a soul exists. What What are your thoughts? We, we need to remember that we were in the same boat until the Spirit moved us. So we just need to keep adhering to the, the Word as closely as we can and then a local church every Sunday if possible. Yeah, yeah. John says you know, that, we, that we're all in the same boat. We, we all started with that same mentality. I think uh, uh, the, the words from Scripture are, and such were some of you. Um, yeah, I, I think you would, yeah, hope. We do have a, a message of hope that's unique, but it can be challenging. If you have people who aren't even sure that, that there's anything to be lost from, you know, sort of this idea of, well, you know, the whole here and now is the only thing. But yeah, we, we have a message of hope that we're hoping in God opens their, their minds and hearts. Allison? It just seems like if they don't believe that a soul exists, if they don't believe that there's anything past what we are and what we have now, that just seems to me like a very cold way to live. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what, where is your, the value? You know what I mean? Like, where is your center? What do you... Have as a core truth, if you don't believe the truth even exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't have that that core, that understanding, as Allison's saying, you, you just you, you're just lost. You have no idea what the base of of your existence is. And then, yeah, finally, go ahead. Um, could you relate it to where they are as far as we know that God has given everyone a conscience. Some yeah. of their consciences are seared, but they have a conscience at least. They don't care if babies are born. But boy, you kill a puppy, you're wrong. So you can relate. Yeah. You know that's wrong to kill a puppy because of your conscience. And you know where that conscience came from? 
Yeah. So you have a soul. I, Kathy, I think, is, is on to something right there that, that is interesting, that yet we appeal to the remaining vestiges of conscience um, that, that people do have. There are certain aspects of our conscience that, that will shine through. Yeah, you, you can look at whether it's a, abortion, whether you look at transgenderism, any of those things. There's, there's something of, of that, uh, of what, of reality as God has created it that will shine through, that we can, that we can appeal to and bring them back to God's word. Is that, is that source of hope? Um, yeah, one more comment. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, it, obviously he used the phrase earlier like unreasoning animals. Yeah. It's, it's a reminder to me that humanly, though, this is impossible. They're, exactly. they're dead in their sins. They, they can't think straight. But the gospel is the power of God. Yeah. So what they need is the gospel. We, you know, we, we don't need to waste our time trying to figure out how to necessarily mm-hmm. reason with these unreasonable animals. They just need the truth. Yeah. And, and our job is to speak truth. And if we speak truth, God's going to use that. Yeah. So Phil was saying that it really comes back down to the gospel. And one thing I was going to bring out, I don't think I have time to go through this fully, but one uh, example um, that, that I think is poignant here, and it discusses people who mock, um, is uh, Paul's witness in Athens at the Areopagus. And you have this, this group of people who are, you know, deep inside their mockers. They're under the, the auspices of, oh, we want to hear this new thing. Let, you know, tell us this new thing you're bringing. And it says at the end, it says, and some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again. But then it says that some believed. Um, but, but really, when you get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of what Paul shared with these people, it's, ex- it's exactly as Phil says. It's just a clear uh, presentation of the gospel. Where, where Paul says, he says, that he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So really, we, we do. We come back to the gospel, we, but we understand we're ministering in, in some ways, maybe a unique context, but in other ways, it's really probably not all that different than the context uh, that Peter was ministering in. I'll go ahead. Um, one thing that we have to remember is that no matter what truth we're delivering to them, we have to deliver it with the love of Christ yeah. and temper it with his love and his understanding because otherwise it sounds... It does, it's coming from us. It's not yeah. coming from the fountain of life. Yeah, absolutely. And so again, uh, tr- t- just uh, for everybody, so you can hear, um, we have to be, we have to show, or share that gospel with love. And I, I think uh, bringing what John said, such were some of you that we all were walking in darkness. That we look at that with a, a good deal of compassion. And I think and this is just uh, Sam ad libbing. Um, but, but I do think on the other side of our current cultural moment um, with things like abortion, uh, transgender movement, all these other things, the church more than anything, more than any other institution, if I can use that term, needs to be prepared to have the voice of compassion and not one of, not one of judgment. Judgment, that, that's God's prerogative, but we've been called to provide that compassionate uh, understanding and say, and such were some of us, and, but let us share with you the gospel that, that brings about restoration. Um, a friend asked me for some help on something, and I couldn't get it through. So I was researching, and I came upon this great line from the Gospel Coalition, and it said, we are to build bridges of grace that bear the weight of truth. Yeah. Can you say that once more? Bridges of grace. Bridges of grace that can bear the weight of truth. Yeah. I thought that was a little succinct and maybe something that will stick in my mind. Maybe not. Yeah. I I like that. That's good. Uh, So, yeah, again, we get back to this idea, scoffer, scoff. They follow their own sinful desires. And then moving to that second aspect, they also, they say certain things. Um, we see in Second Peter 3, 3 and 4, he says, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their sinful desires, they will say, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. 
And so I, I think it's, before we explore the, the specific nature of scoffing, I want to make a connection between false doctrine. Uh, well, I guess we already, we already went into the, this a little bit with the ideas of false doctrine uh, as well as unrighteous living. But just to make the point, which comes first, the false doctrine or the unholy living? And I guess I would probably say yes. Um, and the, I, really, the, the, they feed upon each other. I, you know, as a, as a parent, I've thought through this idea of, um, in terms of works righteousness. Well, when I give my kids instructions, I want them to do it from the right motives. But I also have asked them to do something. And I think in the same way that when, when my children um, you know, sort of drop the shields and they do what they've been asked, that then the heart can be changed, and that there's a there's an interweaving there that is is the body is trained, and then the heart is informed. The heart then informs the actions, and then the actions reinforce the heart in this continual process. And I think it's the same with unholy living as well. That is, you adopt unholy. Uh, ideas, un uh, unholy ideas of who God is and what he requires. But then as you practice those, that's where you see that continuing hardness that, well, I did this, that informs my thinking. You know, I'm right. I need to keep doing this, which drives further examples where you continue to harden yourself in your mind and your actions. And I think that's, that's what we see, that, that heart, the heart trains actions and actions solidify and reinforce the desires of the heart. And so, uh, yeah, again, that, I, I think that quote from, from Bloom that I read earlier, you know, taking that in as well, this idea of um, a people that doesn't recognize even that they have a soul, um, the lostness that comes from that. But then you also look at these ideas of uh, they speak that, that the, it's natural that they'd have uh, desires to live in the here and now, and then to re-solidify that their mind and their actions uh, in pursuit of that. As we look as well, I think it's interesting uh, in that that passage. Uh, well, let's move on to Second Peter three three through seven. I got to keep moving because I'm I'm positive I'm going to run out of time but we're just going to keep trucking and get through what we can. So 2 Peter 3, 3 through 7. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And here we go. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So again, I, I think it's fascinating that the characterization of scoffers uh, 2,000 years ago so closely matches uh, today's scoffers. And I think there's an interesting correlation that I, that I missed probably the first, you know, 50 times I read Second Peter, but I'm going to share it with you. And that you have that benefit when you really just pour over a passage for a long time. But I, it's interesting that the account of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 provides a, a foundation here and an interconnectedness uh, that we might miss to Christ's second coming. And so you have the account of creation, Genesis 1 and 2, that we're, thus we're accountable uh, to God. And, and again, you see in verse 5 here, it's by the word of God that creation occurs. So, and then further, it's the same God uh, who, following man's rebellion, judged the world by a flood. We see that 2 Peter 2, 5, and 2 Peter 3, 6. Right in here, you have the reference to Noah, and then they deliberately overlook that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of the water through the water, again, by the word of God, and that the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. So we, now we have the flood. So we have creation, thus accountability to God. We have the flood, which demonstrated God's judgment for sin, 
and then a reference to a second judgment to come. And then sandwiched in there in verse 4 is, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And so I, to bring in some, some of the modern thinking we have, uh, maybe you've heard of the term uniformitarianism. Um, and really what, what you see in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4 is really geological uniformitarianism, which is, and I'm going to give you this from a 2020 G National Geographic article, so buckle your seatbelts here. Scientists look at modern day geologic events, whether as sudden as an earthquake or as slow as the erosion of a river valley to get a window into past events. This is known as uniformitarianism. The idea that earth has always changed in uniform ways and that the present is the key to the past. Highlight that there. The present is the key to the past. Note that I use a red pen uh, on myself, um, even as I'm teaching. So if, uh, mark your bulletins uh, as well. The principle of uniformitarianism is essential to understanding Earth's history. But I, here's something I didn't know. Prior to 1830, uniformitarianism was not the prevailing theory. Until that time, scientists subscribed to the idea of catastrophism. Okay, as you might think, catastrophism, catastrophe. Catastrophism suggested the features seen on the surface of the earth, such as mountains were formed by large abrupt, abrupt changes or catastrophes. And it wasn't until the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, under scientists um, such as James Hutton and Charles Lyell, if you're a complete dork uh, and have read Charles Darwin's uh, Origin of the Species, um, then you know that Charles Lyell was actually, uh, he was one of the formidable influence, influencers, influencers of uh, Charles Darwin. But uh, why I'm getting to this is the foundation issue of their unbelief was that everything seemed to continue without change. So they're looking back and they're saying everything's just going along as it was before. They, they had no notion of the flood. They, they heard it and they said, well, that's, a, that's an interesting old wives' tale, you know, some, some sort of, uh, you know, legend. But, but they said, but in the here and now, we don't see that. We don't see that God is created and that we're accountable to him. We don't see that, that we don't believe that there was actually this first judgment. Um, and so, and then you link this into the idea of catastrophism, this idea of, well, if the flood was a catastrophic event and the second, the second judgment too is going to be a catastrophic, catastrophic event, but you have a mindset of uniformitarianism that, well, what I see today, that's all there is. There's not going to be any change. Where's God? He's, he's not intervened in light of my supposed sin. Just as, as he doesn't seem to be interacting with creation in any, any sort of special way, because I sure wasn't there at the beginning, and I wasn't there at the flood, and so it, it doesn't exist. I just, you know, put up, put up the screens. And so baked into this idea here that, that Peter's trying to get at is, is this underlying sense of the, the, the foundations, the mindset that these people begin with. And I think it applies to the mindset of people today. We live in, you know, in our scientism, this idea of uniformitarianism, what we see today. That's all there is. But, but we as Christians understand that God, and in, 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 I know there's differences, there's distinctions in, peop, in how people understand this, but at the very root, we see that whether it's in creation or the flood, God reached down and acted in a catastrophic way. That, that the world did not come to be simply by natural processes, that God reached down in a special and significant way and brought the, the earth into being. That God reached down in a very powerful and specific way and judged people in Noah's day. And in that same way, as we get into this, um, his second judgment, his second coming, also will be a significant catastrophic event. And so we have to bring that mindset, un, have that mindset understanding that when we preach the gospel, when we share that gospel, we share it with a people who have a mindset of uniformitarianism, both uh, geologically and also theologically. 
All right. I've got to skip through that a little bit. And we're going to move to the next, well, just by way of aside. And I think we've covered this a little bit. If, if people as well don't understand and don't believe God's revelation about Christ's first coming, it's, it's certain that they're not going to believe uh, anything regarding his second coming. So j I think an understanding there, we need to have that as well, that, that when it comes to um, that part of our, our ministry, our gospel ministry is, is warning um, kindly, gently, winsomely of that judgment to come. We also understand that if they've not believed what God has said about Christ's first coming, there's an extra hurdle there uh, to overcome. All right. So now we have the necessity of reminders. We have that scoffers will come. Now we get into God's judgment is certain because he's promised it. Let's go ahead and read 2 Peter 3, verses 8 through 10. And understand here, there are probably few areas of theology more contentious than those that touch on judgment. So again, I, I think it's, it's important that particularly with judgment, um, we, we share the ideas of judgment uh, in, a, in a grave manner, but also in a manner that, that, that reaches out and out of, of kindness and compassion shares these ideas of God's judgment. Second Peter 3, 8 through 10, I'm going to start actually in 7, says, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed." So just some observations uh, from this um, about God's judgment. So we see in verses 8 through 9, God's judgment is in his own time. And as, you know, when it comes to this passage where it says, uh, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. I, you know, I'll, I've heard it in context when it comes to, you know, for instance, you know, trying to... to count back the number of, of day, you know, years, months, and days back to, you know, what date uh, was the creation, you know? Okay, so was it, is this somehow making a case that, that as opposed to, you know, 6,000 some odd years, that this is actually some, you know, billions of years, something like that? It, this is not discussing anything uh, in regard to that, because Peter provides the interpretation for this passage immediately following. For he says, the Lord, is not um, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish. So he's essentially saying that, that God, uh, God is not constrained by time. It's not saying, okay, do some math equation. One day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So is this over here? Well, should I take it times 1,000 or, or, or 365,000? You know, he's not saying that. He's saying God is not constrained by time. Um, uh, he is not slow as people count slowness. He's patient. Uh, his judgment is, is in his own time. And we see that again in verse 9 where his timing is gracious. This is what we should, should take from this 2,000 years after uh, Peter penned this where he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. The finger coming all the way around the room, pointing at myself as well. The, the patient, he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's a verse for all of us. And for, for any of us, as we, as we consider that day of judgment, consider it with the gravity um, that, is, that is needed, we, we address that topic to ourselves as well as to the world around us. It's a reminder to, to ensure that, that we are in the faith, you know, that we're, that we're not paying lip service to, to the gospel, but that we have embraced that gospel. Um, 
uh, verses that, that um, are important here. Uh, I, I think of the Philippian jailer um, where he said, where he was told, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And it moves to the end of that. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he believed in God. So he's patient. We see in the Philippian jailer, he's, he's about to take his own life. But in that last moment, as he's contemplating that, he saved, um, saved out of that. In, in the same way, we are preaching that gospel to a, to a world that is on, on the brink uh, of destruction each and every moment. Um, and so we don't know when that final judgment will come, but we preach that gospel to ourselves, to those around us, and we recognize that God is gracious in his timing toward you and toward me. We also see in verses 7 and 10 that it will be catastrophic. We see um, it, passages where it said, the earth that now exists is stored up for fire, as well in verse 10, uh, that the heavens will pass away with a roar heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. It will be catastrophic, uh, that judgment. And then it will be sudden. So there's a close correlation uh, to 2 Peter 3. We don't have time to, to go into it in depth, but you can jot it down in your margins. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 1 through 6 uh, has a, a very close correlation uh, to this passage where it talks about um, that... Um, that the Lord comes like a thief in the night. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Um, and that that will usher in that final judgment. Just to talk very briefly uh, about the day of the Lord, uh, it appears in 19 Old Testament and four New Testament verses. Um, a, a definition that I found is that the day of the Lord is defined as a phrase used in the Bible to emphasize special interventions of God in human history, including the future time when he will intervene to judge the nations, discipline Israel, and establish his rule in the Messianic kingdom. It can be used to describe uh, near historical judgments or far eschatological divine judgments. So you, uh, you'll see it in different um, aspects like Isaiah, 13, where it's referring to Babylon. You also see it uh, in other places like um, Malachi, where it appears to be pointing much further down the road. Um, other synonyms would be day of doom, day of vengeance, and day of wrath. But it's enough to say, suffice to say, that these are terrifying judgments uh, for the overwhelming sinfulness of the world. Um, but understand, again, that imagery and those warnings from the perspective, again, going back to, to God's graciousness in his timing, that God desires that none should perish, but that should, all should reach repentance. But at the same time, we recognize God will judge. As I said previously, uh, God's judgment is, is one of those areas uh, where, where you will probably get some immediate pushback that, that God would actually judge. And there's a, an interesting passage I want to just read briefly. And this is in, uh, if you ever... Just make sure, have, have some good commentaries around the house. They can be helpful. But uh, Michael Green says, anthropocentric hedonism, I love that. Anthropocentric hedonism always mocks at the idea of ultimate standards in a final division between saved and lost. For men who live in the world of the relative, the claim that the relative will be ended by the absolute is nothing short of ridiculous. For men who nourish a belief in human self-determination and perfectibility, the very idea that we are accountable and dependent is a bitter pill to swallow. So again, just, just shows the mentality of the world when you bring in these ideas of a judgment to come. In their mind, it's ridiculous. It's ludicrous that there is such a thing as a judgment to come. All right, we have about five minutes. I'm going to move us into, if you have other questions about the day of the Lord, I offer uh, Aaron and Phil as great references there to discuss that. All right, and finally, uh, moving into 
final imperatives for Christians. I've categorized this under the three therefores. You will note as you look in your ESV version of the Bible that there are only two therefores, and that's because I cheated, and I um, am pulling the three therefores from the New King James Version. But I think it's uh, easy to make that claim that there are three therefores. We're going to start with verse 11, read through 18. Borrowing from the New King James, therefore, moving into ESV, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of, of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So briefly, these three therefores, we see the first one in verse 11. So, and keep in mind, as we kind of circle back to the very first things we talked about, this is Peter's final opportunity to tell these believers. He's got his last chance. He understands that he is, as he says in chapter one, to put off this tent. He is about um, to not be uh, in a position to pass them any more of this wisdom. So these three therefores, I, I take very seriously is, is sort of his last call to say, these are the most important things. So verse 11, since the present earth will be destroyed, then our conduct should be godly. It should be holy, looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth. In other words, Christians should adopt an eternal perspective, not a temporal one. There are many things that make this difficult. We all live in the here and now. We have jobs to do. We have kids to raise. We have bills to pay. We have dishes to do. All those things. There are, there are things that tax us constantly that move our minds from the eternal to the temporal. But Paul, or, sorry, but Peter is saying here, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in, the, in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Look forward to that day. So think in a more eternal mindset, not that it diminishes what we do here in the temporal plane, I'm not saying that, but we have a, a mindset that looks forward. So we should think about how do we discipline ourselves? What do we do to change our affections, to change our thinking? If I had more time, I'd take you to Revelation 21 to see that, that, that appearing of, of uh, the new heavens and the new earth. Next, verse 14, be diligent to live righteously because the Lord is indeed gracious to delay his coming, giving you an opportunity to repent. So we see here, have an eternal mindset, understand that he's gracious to delay his coming, giving you an opportunity to repent. And then finally, his last therefore, verse 17, is beware. I think that's interesting that he, in the very last thing, he understands that there are all sorts of competing narratives there are competing desires that we are faced with. But he says there in verse 17, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Uh, I think a great tandem to that is Proverbs 1, 10 through 16. He says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. 
If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole. Like those who go down to the pit, we shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. And then here's the wisdom. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. So he's saying, beware, remain steadfast. Don't go down that path. Um, make sure that you are um, uh, continuing in that path of righteousness. And then he says, finally, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So circling back continually, and I have about 45 seconds, is it we are people that need reminders, each and, every one of the, each and every one of us. If you are ever in a spot where you're thinking, you know, I wonder um, what things I need to be reminded of, Second Peter chapter 3, it's a great place to go. We all need reminders. Um, and then also remember these, these three therefores that we have an eternal mindset that we uh, would be focusing on the graciousness of God and delaying his com coming for our sakes, but also for the sakes of those around us. That, as John said, such were some of you, such were all of us. And so we take that opportunity to be gospel-minded, to, to share the gospel, that others might know that as well. And then finally, to beware, to, to continue to walk faithfully. And with that, we need to be done for the day. So uh, we're dismissed. Thanks.